Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. I hope all, you all enjoy your lunch and the nice weather. Uh, so welcome to section 12B, Application Security. And sorry for my voice. Uh, so we have various four very exciting work in this session, okay? And uh, the first one is, uh, uh, will be presented by Aspat Al Carey. He's from the University of uh, uh, Trenty. And uh, the title is uh, Replica Watcher Training a training list anomaly detection in containerized uh, microservices. Yes. Okay. So hi everyone. My name is Asbat El Khairi. I'm a PhD student at the University of Twente, and today I will be uh, presenting our research paper, Replica Watcher, a training list anomaly based IDS for microservices. So. One critical limitation that often hinders the deployment of anomaly-based intrusion detection system in a real-world setting is their reliance on a baseline of normal behavior. So while this baseline are foundational for flagging abnormal behavior at runtime, they can be a problem. Indeed, according to research, this baseline can age gradually and can lose effectiveness over time. So this inability to stay current and up to date can generate a lot of false positives and ultimately can lead to alert fatigue. So the problem of baseline aging can get amplified in the context of dynamic deployments such as microservices. As you probably know, microservices support agile development. In other words, they support continuous updates and continuous incremental changes. The problem is that these incremental changes can be very frequent, which can lead to frequency in, or sorry, frequent normality shifts. So to have an idea about how frequent these changes can be, let's take a look at the example of Netflix. So Netflix makes hundreds of production changes to their microservices per day. So let's take a look at an example of how an incremental change can lead to a normality shift. And let's take the example of system calls. System calls are the most widely used telemetry when it comes to anomaly-based intrusion detection. So imagine we have this application which prints the current time every 10 seconds for a duration of 10 minutes. And let's say we dockerize it and we use here as a base operating system image PHP Apache Buster. And at runtime, we get this set of system calls. So let's say we want to build an anomaly-based IDS for this application. So we will build our baseline just from the syscalls that represent normal behavior, whitelisted system calls. So for some reasons, we decide to, let's say, um, upgrade the base operating system from, let's say, Buster to Boost I. And now at runtime, we monitor it and we see, let's say, slightly different set of system calls, most specifically at this level. So here, clock nanoslip seems to replace nanoslip. So this replacement is caused by a change at the level of the base operating system, but more specifically, it's caused by an upgrade at the JLibC package. So here, clock nanoslip seems to replace nanoslip, offering high resolution slip functionality with selectable clock. Well, in terms of performance, it's great, but from the perspective of the baseline that we just built, it's really bad. Why? Because clock nanoslip does not exist in the baseline. So which means the anomaly-based IDS will throw a false alarm. So usually to handle this kind of problems, people retrain their baselines. But retraining in security applications can be really challenging. The first challenge is related to the necessity for security expertise. So here you need a man in the loop. You need a security expert able to distinguish between a normality drift and a real anomaly. Not only that, you need a labeled data set. So creating a labeled, or sorry, labeling a data set can be, or can require a lot of, of effort and can be very time consuming. Last but not least, the frequent retraining. So retraining can be very frequent, especially when it comes to dynamic deployments such as microservices. I just showed you the example of Netflix. So the high frequency of changes makes retraining really infeasible in the settings. So the question that we can arise here, how to build an anomaly-based IDS for containerized microservices without a training? 
So to do so, we need to leverage two properties of microservice-based environment. The first property is related to separation of concerns. So in microservices, instead of having the whole logic combined in one monolithic stack, you can split an application into modular units where each unit is dedicated for a ver very specific and narrow task. So containerized microservices will be designed for very specific and narrow task. And the second principle or let's say property that we leverage is the replication uh, fundamental or feature provided by orchestration platforms. So Kubernetes and Docker Swarm and other orchestration platforms provide replicas for either fault tolerance or scalability reasons. So for example, instead of having just one workload, you can have any number of workloads to serve traffic. So if we combine these two principles, we can come up with this intuition. So given the fact that microservices are narrow in terms of scope and are replicated, we can say, we can safely say that replicas should behave nearly identically. So under normal setting, they should show some consistent behavior. While under attack, when one replica is compromised, they should show inconsistent behavior. So our core idea is the following. We can detect anomalies by comparing the behavior of replicas. Well, the idea sounds nice and shows the great advantage of not relying on a baseline, but it's not really that easy to implement. Why? Because of background noise. So it's true that replicas perform the same or execute the same task, but they can still generate some background noise. This noise can be generated because of different traffic loads, differences in user inputs, or even resource contention. However, we found that background noise can be controlled, making comparison between replicas possible. So how to control background noise? So first, we decided to select observables that show less sensitivity to background noise. And we have the following let's say, type of kernel events that we start with. So we start with these types of observables, and these observables span different aspects of container behavior, like uh, we have syscall, file descriptor, process. So after that, we conduct a preliminary assessment to select observable or kernel events that are less sensitive to noise. And this is the result. So we got 10 let's say types of kernel events that are less sensitive to noise. And the second thing that we did to control the background noise, we select an optimized comparison interval that promotes consistent behavior and also flattens out outliers. So the result of our preliminary assessment is the following. So we found that short intervals are or lead to more noise and long intervals lead to less noise and we empirically select 30 seconds as an interval time to compare. So let's take a look now at, an, at Replica Watcher in, 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 in general, or let's take a look at the architecture of Re Replica Watcher. So let's say we have this replicas running on a node, worker node, which belongs to, let's say, a Kubernetes cluster. So the first thing we leverage, or sorry, we, 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 we we uh, tap into um, the kernel interaction between the operating system kernel and, and, and the replicas. And for that reason, we leverage SysDIC as a tracing tool to tap into the kernel events. And to be more specific, we built our own Chisel. And Chisel, by the way, is a Lua script that you can build or you can write to extend SysDIC functionality beyond its standard output. So once we get the kernel events, we pass them to Replica Watcher, and there we do three steps. So even chunking, we chunk events into monitoring intervals, event encoding, and anomaly detection. So let's take a look at each one in detail. So for event chunking, here we split the ongoing flow of kernel events into short monitoring intervals. So each interval is a snapshot. So this snapshot describes the behavior of replicas for a specific time interval. And from our preliminary assessment, the interval duration is 30 seconds. In event encoding, 
So it's pretty much straightforward. So we just organize events into sets based on their types for every replica. And for the comparison, so here our aim is to compare replicas to identify those that show considerable uh, degree of dissimilarity. So we represent each replica by a dissimilarity score vectors. So each score here reflects how a replica differs from its counterparts regarding a feature category. And for that reason, we compare sets using the Jacquard similarity technique. So for anomaly detection, so remember our first assumption, under normal settings, replica should behave exactly the same, which means that the, the similarity scores should be close to zero. And this also means that replica's dissimilarity score vector should converge, sorry, should converge to origin. So here the origin is like a trusted area of normality that we can compare against. So basically here we leverage the Euclidean distance between the origin and replicas, and we use that distance as a threshold to flag abnormal behavior. So uh, an alarm is simply triggered if the Euclidean distance from origin passes a certain threshold. So we evaluate replica watcher in terms of two aspects, resilience against normality shifts and also detection performance. So we tested our uh, tool or our approach against two e-commerce platforms, Google Online Boutique, three attack scenarios, and Homebro, which, our, which is our own application that we built just for that. It includes 10 attack scenarios. And this attack scenario span four threat families, like information disclosure, command injection, remote code executions, and so on. So let's start with resilience against normality shifts. So here we conducted three experiments. So we upgrade the base operating system, we upgrade a dependency package, and we also change something in the application code. So let's start with the first one, upgrade at the level of the base operating system. So here we compare Replica Watcher, our tool against or to existing training-based solutions like CHIDS, STIDE, bag of system calls, and CDL. So here the dash and bars represent post-update values. So here you can clearly see that in terms of false positives, Replica Watcher almost maintained the same rate even post-update. However, when it comes to CHIDS, we can clearly see that the rate of false positives go high just after update. And the same applies for STIDE bag of system calls. For CDL, it's a different case. So uh, false positives almost like even gets uh, less, but the performance is really poor. So you can take a look at the true positive rate. So it's still very low. And the reason for that is CDL is a frequency based approach so it flags high frequency rather than abnormal, let's say, system calls. Now for the upgrade at the level of dependency package, it's exactly the same pattern. Replica Watcher almost maintains the same uh, false positive rate, but we can see a huge or a high increase in false positive rate for CHIDS and STIDE bank of system calls. And again, the same applies when we change something in the application code, Replica Watcher keeps its resiliency against uh, updates as compared to the others. So despite the fact that Replica Watcher does not rely on a training baseline, it still performs good. So we scored like uh, good results in terms of precision, recall, and F1 score and accuracy for every threat family. And it's noteworthy here that uh, we use here a unified threshold across all attack scenarios. So security teams can fine tune uh, this threshold to maximize the performance of Replica Watcher. So when comparing Replica Watcher to training based solutions, so we can say that we out, not outperform what, but we perform comparably to training-based solutions. So for example, we outperform SDL and STIDE bag of system calls, but we uh, score a bit less than HIDS. 
So replica watcher has some limitations. And the first one is related to attacks with the same input across all replicas at the same time. So an attacker can bypass replica watcher if he manages to, let's say, um, attack all replicas all at the same time with exactly the same input, like with exactly the same malicious pay payload, for example. But this is a bit challenging. Why? Because the attacker needs to know the exact number of replicas deployed. And the problem is this number changes dynamically. So this is a challenge for the attacker. Another challenge is related to the benign concurrent traffic. So there is no guarantee that an attacker can, let's say, affect all the replicas simultaneously because there is a concurrent benign traffic going on. And the second challenge is related to brute force attacks. So as you know, brute force is just a let's say, a repetitive uh, action of, of, or a repetitive sequence of requests, exactly the same request to either crack a password or break an authentication scheme. So the problem here, replicas sit behind a load balancer, and that load balancer distributes traffic in an even fashion. So all the replicas would, re would receive, let's say, the same load, which means would behave exactly the same. So the attacker would bypass replica watch. And last but not least, scalability in the multi-cluster setups. So when it comes to setups that have a lot of nodes and a lot of clusters, so we expect the latency to be really high, which will affect the performance of replica watch. So in conclusion, replica watcher requires no training, shows resilience against normality shifts, and performs comparable to training-based solutions. So we published uh, the code under this link, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you, speaker. Uh, thank the speaker. Uh, any questions? I have a. F oh. Hi, thank you for this talk, uh, Yanin from Columbia University. Maybe I missed it, but I was wondering if you consider the, the, the option of alerting the replica watcher that an update is happening to kind of prime. Uh, Sorry, I, I can't hear you. OK, I'll try again. So I was wondering if you considered, or maybe you did that and I missed it, alerting replica watcher that an update is happening to kind of restart the timers or do anything else to kind of adjust to the update alongside everything else that you're doing. The update of what? The image, like one of the images. Oh, okay, so Replica Watcher does not really um, consider the update. So uh, because, um, um, as you can see, all containers start from an image, and all images start from a Docker file. So all replicas would run exactly the same image. Yeah, so even when you, let's say, when you upgrade or when you update the image, so you start a new set of replicas. Yeah, but in, in just as a follow-up, in some cases you might do a rolling update or start updating some of the images and kind of play with it. And in that scenario, uh, you're not you need to split the cases or something. Very good point. But in Kubernetes, like orchestra, most orchestration platforms, um, support the uh, update with zero downtime. So which means um, you can roll updates in a way that. Um, uh, let's say um, it, it won't generate too much noise. And here you can leverage, for example, readiness probes or liveness probes to make sure that Replica Watcher is not really affected by that, let's say, noise coming from updates. Thank you. We can take it offline. Too. Yeah, sure. Hi, Roland Yap from NUS. Uh, so classically, IDS like systems normally suffer from mimicry attacks. So have you thought about attacks of that type against your system? Now, for example, one attack could be that, so suppose the attacker knows your system calls you've chosen, right? And that, that's not a secret. But then, you know, they just have to pad the attack so that most of the system calls are the ones you have chosen. And maybe there's only one which is 
and they just have to lengthen. So they have to lengthen the attack, basically. Of course, it depends whether you can do that or not. Yeah, so for mimicry attacks, so, um, well, you can replace, let's say, uh, some system calls with other equivalents that are benign, but our approach not only considers system calls, it considers also like process-based features, file descriptor features. So for a mimicry attack to succeed, an attacker needs to manipulate also these arguments, not only the system Correct. call. So the attacker's job is to push down the difference vector. And you just have to push it down to be below your threshold. Yeah, so yeah, so here he needs to somehow stage the attack in a way that can stay below the threshold. Right, and right. for and that I'm, I'm not sure whether that is difficult. So he, he needs first to know what is the threshold. That might not be a secret. But we run some experiments regarding that, so um, um, I can show you. We can, we can take it offline. Oh, I'm fine. just wondering whether you considered it. So we tested Replica Watcher against evasions, and here we um, play somehow the, the role of a stealthy attacker that is doing, um, um, let's say, an attack in a, in a kill chain fashion. So. Um, like starting with reconnaissance and ending with cleanup. So Replica Watcher proves to be, um, let's say, more effective when it comes to exfiltration and, 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 and later stages. So um, you can bypass Replica Watcher with some commands to do some reconnaissance, but when it comes to heavy activities such as data exfiltration or execution of code, you cannot really uh, bypass Replica Watcher. All right, let's thank the speaker again. Um.